just to tell you a little bit about myself, I am a missionary kid. Uh, my parents are missionaries, and I have been over um, exposed to other cultures, also known as a TCK, as a third culture kid. So I have grown up in a different cultural environment than my um, the one that I was born with. So that experience, that rich experience, has given me as I traveled overseas with my parents to Fiji, Indonesia, Australia, Malaysia, Singapore. This journey has given me so much experience and that is what I want to share with you through this course. Um, and because our course name, course title is Introduction to Evangelism, this will hopefully help you um, have a practical, not only a theoretical, not only philosophical, but a practical approach to evangelism. Uh, I just want to briefly go over our syllabus. As you know, our courses are divided into 10 lectures. First will be an introduction, um, introductory session. Uh, second week, we will, we will cover what evangelism is, the definition of and why we evangelize. So part one, it says, if you follow the syllabus with me on page two, it says, why evangelize? And we will see why um, our great commission has been given to us by Christ and how we have omitted that in, to, to, to a certain degree. Um, third week, we will cover part two of why we evangelize. Part two will be the challenge of Christian evangelism. I'll make a case for that. And um, the, the fourth week, we will talk about what is evangelism. We'll, go into the biblical basis of evangelism. Um, the fifth week, we will cover convictional basis of evangelism. Sixth, spiritual basis. And seven, ministerial, mystical basis. And eighth, we will come, finally come to how we evangelize, the methodology of evangelism. Um, we'll cover the methodological basis of evangelism, and those will be divided into part one and two. And the tenth week, finally, we will cover all the things that we have learned so far. Um, as you see on the screen, um, we, I have this book, our, our main textbook, it is Introduction to Evangelism by Alvin Reed. Um, if you have this book, it's, it's online, you can order through Amazon. Um, this book will be our primary um, source, primary textbook. And I will go on, I will refer to this back and forth. Um, throughout our lectures. And I'll also um, mention um, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God by J.I. Packer um, and also the Holy Bible. And I'll talk about um, instances and I'll begin each day with, with a devotional and we will cover what, how we go into um, our main topic our, our, for, for the day, what we'll cover every day for the syllabus. So if you have your Bibles with me right now, I just want to share a little bit before we go into our lecture. Um, our passage comes from John, John chapter 3. And I just want to go over um, what Christ has shown us, the master evangelist. And we will see how in, in Christ's dialogue with certain people that he encounters um, through the gospel of John and and. Each week that, that we cover these topics, I just, want, I just want everyone to focus on what on how Christ um, presents the gospel and in, in communicating the gospel and why he does this and what he what he produced what he gives as the gospel message and how he does it. And we just want to focus on the why and the what and the how. And I just want to always begin each week with a passage in John and how Christ shows us as an example of how to um, evangelize. And I just want to read and just follow along. I'm reading from the ESV. As you see, the required readings, also uh, the English Standard Version. Um, so if you have a different version, that is fine. Just follow along with me and, and listen and capture what, what, just try to picture what Jesus was thinking about when he encountered these people. So I'm reading from John chapter 3, uh, verse 1. Now, 
There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and when you hear its sound, um, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I said to you, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has, no one has ascended into heaven except he who had descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I just want to say a brief word of prayer and he openly associates himself with Jesus. Hey, this is Christ. He was a man. He was an innocent man. And, and me be associating with him, I am putting my shoes with him. I'm with him. It was a proclamation. And this gradual process we see with Nicodemus begins right here in John 3. Um, Nicodemus comes to him at night um, and he starts saying, Rabbi, teacher, I know that you do these things, you do these miraculous signs, and we know that you cannot just do this by your own power. You have been sent from God, sent from the Lord, and I see that now, you are a teacher from God. And Jesus, first of all, he says a truth statement to Nicodemus. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. First, he, he introduces what Nicodemus was longing for. He wanted an answer to eternal life. Nicodemus has kept the law, and according to Jewish tradition, he was the best of the best of the best. He received the best education, he was learned, but here comes a man from Galilee, not received any education. He was a builder, he was a craftsman, he was a carpenter. He says to this like religious leader, ruling elite, Nicodemus, say, he, he says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He can't even see it. This is how we are redeemed. We need to be born again. We don't earn our way into heaven. Many religious folk stumble right here. Religion is a system of beliefs that you have to earn your way to God, or you have to work, climb a mountain to get to the Lord. And, and this is very different to what Christ proclaims the gospel to be. He says, unless one is born again, he needs to be birthed into the kingdom. You cannot earn your way. And Nicodemus asks this question, how can a man be born again when he has already um, been born? And when he is old, Nicodemus was an old man. Religious elite. He has position. He has power. 
But he asked Jesus. This was the source of his question. How can I attain eternal life? That is the fundamental telos, the goal, the final end goal of salvation, isn't it? It's for eternal life. How can I obtain, attain eternal life? How can I be born again? How can I see the kingdom of God? Jesus answers this again. It's, you see this dialogue happening, this give and give and take, asking and answering questions. This was Jesus' method. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of, kingdom of God. See what has changed you first. He said, truly, truly, you cannot see unless you've been born again. Now Jesus says you cannot enter unless you are born again of water and the Spirit. A little bit different here. Jesus goes deeper saying that, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. Not only you have to be born again, but you have to be born particularly of water and the Spirit. Jesus here is, of course, mentioning baptism of water and born the the spirit of um, born being born again by the spirit, meaning the regeneration. Jesus is talking about regeneration, being rebirthed, and every believer must go through this spiritual rebirth. We believe, as Reformed Christian, we believe that what is what is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. We need to be regenerated. We need to be reborn. Our spirit is totally depraved, totally dead because of our fall in Genesis 3. We believe that we need to be born again in the spirit in order to enter God's kingdom. This is what Christ says. And Jesus answers Nicodemus in a, in, 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 in a crazy way. He says, do not marvel at this. Do not marvel astonishing way. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Because Jesus says as the wind blows and you see branches and you see the effects of this. So it is with the Spirit. You don't see it with your eyes, but you are born again. And when you are born again, you have a standing before the Lord. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus says, how can these things be? Jesus answers him and gives him the story when Moses lifted up the serpent. And everyone, the Israelites, when they were bit by the serpent and the poison, the sting of death was inching closer and closer and closer. What happens? God instructs Moses in the wilderness as, as the people of Israel were suffering almost to death. God says, get a serpent of bronze, put it up in, in a pole, and, and, and put it and raise it up in, in the midst of the crowd, and the people of Israel, so that everyone who may see the serpent and believes will have, will have healing, will um, be healed from the, the bite of the poisonous bite of the snake. And Jesus mentions, mentions this, to Nicodemus, so that he will understand. Jesus talks about something that Nicodemus will have already have memorized and known for so many years. They have memorized the Torah so much so that they will know this. When Jesus says, Moses lifted up serpent, Nicodemus knows right away what that means. That even though the poison, the sting of death was inching closer and closer and closer, when the people of Israel believe what Moses said, ah, I, if I look at the serpent, this is what Moses said, if I look at the serpent that is raised in the wilderness on the pole, this bronze serpent, if I just look at it, if I believe it, that faith will heal me. That faith will deliver me. And that was what Jesus was talking about. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And, and here comes John's 3.16. Um, we need to understand this verse, not just out of John, as separately as John 3.16, but we must know, we must understand this verse 
in the context of all these questions before. Please do the honor, do the scripture honor by reading the, the verses before John 3.16. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he loved the world in this way, so that when he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn it, but in order for the world to be saved through Christ. This was God's purpose all along. And this is what evangelism, this master evangelist with Nicodemus, you will see throughout John as he encounters different people and you will learn that Christ spoke to every man, whether status, whether rich or poor, young and old, powerful or the weak, strong or the desolate. It's different. God, God, Jesus reaches up and shares the gospel in a way that, that fits, understands, um, goes down to the level of sometimes people who are desperately in need just to hear a loving voice, sometimes desperately in need to hear a rebuke. Jesus' method is, isn't always gospel. If you believe in me, you will live. If you, if you uh, don't believe me, you will die. It's not always one method. He always changes his approach. He always changes his, his um, method. So we want to just focus on what he has. This message stands true. Gospel message is the same. He is the word. He is life. He is the way. He is the truth. And yet this word, this living word of God has been shown, has, has been dwelling with, as, as First John 1 says, he was who was in the beginning made his dwelling with us. The Word became flesh and tabernacle with us, and He has become this, like what John 3 says, the serpent raised, so that whoever sees and believes and puts their faith on this person will have eternal life. This is the gospel saturated into this one verse, deception. This famous verse that we all learn in Sunday school. But there's so much in here, in that. And we want to just dig in to what John 3.16 says. And as we jump into our lecture today, um, I just want us to be mindful of what John 3 says and the example of the Master Evangelist Christ. Um, as you see in our lecture notes, we just want to transition into our lecture um, there is a lot in here. So I know, uh, I just want to quote what my seminary professor said to me before we begin. It's like climbing Mount Everest. And, and it, it is so with evangelism. Sometimes we, we are like guides. We are like mountain guides going on a big, long journey and going with someone. But it is a journey that only you, that only one person can take. You, I cannot force anyone to take that journey, to climb that mountain. But it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be difficult, but when you have reached the peak, when you have reached the summit, and when you see everything below, it'll all be worth it, it'll all be worth it. So we just wanna dive into our uh, lecture today, Intro to Evangelism. Um, first, I just wanna go over what we'll be talking about throughout this course. Um, as you follow along, you can see here, I um, just want to mention before starting that um, my lecture notes are a combination of what I've learned in seminary with, I, with what I have heard um, through testimonies of missionaries, pastors, and also what I have learned from my uh, previous professor, Dr. Daniel J. Kim, and um, his the notes that I have um, written down as a student, and this has helped a lot in what I want to do, what I want to speak about, what I want to lecture about. So I just want to give a heads up. 
Um, I just want to focus on a recommended reading. Um, um, if you have a chance to get your hands on this book, it's Reasonable Faith by Dr. William Lane Crane. Um, this is a, a fundamental, um, most basic uh, textbook in evangelism and defending your faith, knowing your faith. And this is all in the syllabus. And we just want to jump right into our lecture today. Um, first, the essence. I want to talk about the essence. Um, uh, number one, it says essential definition of, if you see on the screen, essential definition of evangelism. Here I have these scriptures. Um, 1 John 4, 14, John 15, 26, Matthew 28, 19, Acts 1, 8. As you see, Matthew 28 and Acts 1, 8 are the great commission. And as you see in our lecture, the first of syllabus, the first is intro to evangelism, and second is great commission. The last words that Jesus has spoken on earth to his followers, and basically his last words on earth to us, to all his disciples, was go, was sending. Go, ye, go, therefore go. He sent out his disciples. And as we come to this um, beginning of our lecture period, God says, go. God's son, his last words on earth was, go. And we need to understand this missional, the sending out nature of God. And we need to know the essence of God in order to understand evangelism. What is evangelism? Evangelism must start from God, who God is. And I believe, I want to make the case that God is a sending, missional, go, evangelistic God. God, the essence of Him, I want to talk about essence, His is God's nature, God's essence. He is a Trinitarian God. He is a missional God. And He is God the Father who sends His Son to the earth as we have learn and, and meditate about John 3 16. I hope you think about John 3 as we um, cover our lecture today. God sends the Son and God sends the Holy Spirit. God the Son sends the Holy Spirit. See the Trinitarian theology here working. So the mission of God the Father sends His Son to redeem the world and the Son as he is lifted, as he ascends into heaven, sends the Holy Spirit. We will cover the essence of Christ. Who is Christ? And we will cover incarnational Christology, missional Christology, and our understanding of evangelism must come from God the Father and God the Son. The essence of humanity, who God is and who we are. Isn't this the basic concept of devotional? And we, we open up the word and we see that it is who is God. We ask this question all the time. Who God is? Who is God? And who am I? Isn't this the basic, basic understanding of the word? Base, basis of our philosophy? An essence of humanity. Imago Dei. We'll talk about Imago Dei, the image of God. We we're created not only um, just as flesh and blood, but as image of God, Imago Dei. We have been commissioned by a Trinitarian missional God. And I want to talk about nature, essence of our nature, essence of the nature, cosmos, the universe, a world, a physical world. And I want to then focus on the essence of spirituality. Um, I want to make this point that contrary to the rest of creation, human beings have been breathed out by God. Imago Dei, as I have mentioned. This Ruach, this Spirit, when it touches flesh, when God breathed out His life, and, and it became, this creation became Nefesh Kaya, in Hebrew, living creature. So the Spirit, or the spiritual, is essential to understanding evangelism, just as deep cries out to deep, flesh uh, is of no use. 
Jesus mentions, as we have men mentioned, as we have seen in John 3, flesh is of no use. John 6, uh, it says, Jesus says, flesh is of no use, but the spirit that gives life. Again, John 3, it says, we need to be born of the spirit. Jesus says again, John 3, you need to be born of spirit and water. You need to be born again. John 6, 63, as I mentioned, who gives life? It's the spirit, Ruach, who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. John 6, 63. So, so, here is my main point of our whole lecture in this course. I want to make this thesis statement that the essence of spirituality um, is this. I want to make this point that evangelism is actually a spiritual discipline. Again, I want to say it again. Evangelism is actually a spiritual discipline. This is the case. This is the point that I want to prove and I want to argue in our lecture throughout the 10 weeks that we have. My point, every lecture will be about drilling in this point that evangelism is actually a spiritual discipline. In fact, evangelism is the loftiest, is the highest form of spiritual discipline for because it covers all other disciplines, theology, um, Christology, it, it encompasses everything, it's systemic in a way. You need to know what you believe before you can preach it. You need to know what you know, you need to know what you have faith in before you can share it to others. Isn't that right? You need to have a correct understanding of it before you can share the gospel. And here wraps up our essence and we come to the teaching of the evangelistic principle. Secondly, we'll talk about, follow along with me in our lecture notes, and as you see on the screen, it's the essence, essential definition versus essence, uh, essence of evangelism. I talked about essence of God, Christ, humanity, all the essences. Second is about teaching, teaching, heralding, proclaiming. This is what evangelism means, isn't it? You need to proclaim it. You need to herald, like a herald, as a messenger, be sent, and so that you can share a message. And I want to briefly touch on charismatic didactic teaching principles and preaching. And my um, scriptural basis comes from First Timothy second, First uh, Timothy chapter two, verse seven, and Second Timothy chapter one, verse eleven. And I want to hear. I want to focus on Paul's method, the Pauline method. His method was fundamentally a teaching approach. And I want to cover this in a way um, that whenever you have a chance to preach and teach, this is not only just the pastor's role, but every believer's role to fundamentally go and teach and preach. Isn't that what Christ says? Christ says, go and ye into the nations, go and teach and preach everything that I have taught you. Herald. Proclaim it, teach it. So therefore, Paul's method was just like the Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples of every nation, of tribe and tongue, and teach what all that I have proclaimed to you. Teach them, teach them, teach everything. So Paul's main primary method was fundamentally a didactic teaching approach. He taught whenever he could. He went to the synagogues. He went to the people, he went to the Gentiles, he went to the meeting places, he went to the temple, and he preached the gospel, he taught, and he debated, he argued, and he had this fundamental teaching approach. And also Christian evangelism, I want to focus on this too. It was centered on the foundation of the Bible, Scripture, Logos, the written word of God. So our, our scriptural uh, evangelism, our evangelism focuses on not only the heralding, teaching, proclaiming, but it needs to be from based on the word of God. That 
is our foundation. This biblical foundation um, of evangelism is not only in the OT, Old Testament law, not only in the prophets, not only in the New Testament, but it's an apostolic tradition as well. So all throughout the Bible, all throughout our stories and heroes and, and biblical heroes and apostles, prophets, um, it's all about this biblical foundation, this teaching. And for first step, and, and, and lastly, in this teaching section, I want to focus on Christ Jesus as a fundamental model. And as I have done that today with John 3, as we have shared in the Bible, um, our, our, our model, evangelistic model, must be focused, our primary evangelist, evangelistic model must be focused on Christ, our Lord, and how He had approached evangelism. And thirdly, our goal, our telos of evangelism is AIM. I want to take the first three letters of AIM, A-I-M, this approaching, approaching, Matthew 28, 19, and this is the Great Commission. Um, but first, I want to talk about approaching, how to approach, how to approach an individual. You can't just sit in, 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 in lecturing and classrooms and seminaries, and, and you can't evangelize someone when you don't approach them. You need to approach them first. You need to have a hope. You need to have that desire. You need to have a goal to go out and approach them. First is approaching an individual. Approach someone that you want to win over. And second is I, aim, and in, in the first letters of aim, is second is I, inviting, inviting them, inviting them in a winsome manner. Not only invite them to Bible study, church, just invite them to a meal, invite them to your home, invite them to events. Invite, inviting is so powerful for it, not only you only have made that approach, but inviting um, pr provides a chance for you maybe to sow plant seeds and you're inviting them thinking about okay i need to win this person over so inviting them in a winsome manner is so important in this um, the goal the end goal of evangelism and lastly uh, the letter m maintaining and not only you just want to preach the gospel and that's it not only you want to hold a bullhorn and say christ is the way to heaven you don't believe me, you're going to go to hell, as, as, as some evangelists do. You want to maintain, the, lastly, uh, the last word of AIM, maintain. Maintaining a meaningful relationship with the person that you have evangelized to, even if they reject you initially. So my encouragement for this part is never give up. Never give up. Who knows? Who knows that a seed that you planted many, many years ago, afterwards you would so, and then read many, many years later. So it is important to maintain a good relationship. Um, I want to just focus on these things. And um, let's go into, secondly, second part, why we evangelize. So again, le lectures, uh, second, third lectures will be about why we evangelize. First part, break a mission, a mission. Part two, challenge of Christian evangelism. I want to make a case of evangelism being spiritual as the loftiest part, loftiest, um, the goal, uh, loftiest spiritual discipline, highest form of spiritual discipline. Part two, I want to, I want to focus, I want to say that challenge of Christian evangelism is real. The challenge of Christian evangelism is evident in our culture today. And then thirdly, um, we go to what is evangelism and this is part two right here uh, why evangelize the mandate the mandate we need to go the mandate of evangelism first great commission great commission Jesus sent house sent out his 72 disciples in Luke 10 Jesus Christ our Lord commanded us before his ascension he says go Therefore, make disciples of every nation. You go, it's a command. You go. Um, 
Mathete in Greek is, if you see on the screen, mathetes is a Greek word for disciple. Make disciples. We need to go and not only have a winsome manner, approach them, invite them, maintain good relationship, but we need to make, a, eventually, we need to make them a disciple. Just as Christ made many disciples, he left nothing, he never wrote an autobiography, he never wrote anything, he never left anything, he didn't own anything, but he made disciples. Isn't that interesting? He, wherever he went, he made disciples. And then Jesus says this in his great commission, in the, in the last, very last words that he said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Greek word is baptizo, baptize. Baptizing them, them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. See here the essence of God, the essence of who God is. Trinitarian theology right here. And then Christ says in Matthew 28, 19, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Didasco. This is the didactic method, the teaching method that Paul took. This commission came with a great promise, as you, and we will cover that later on. This great promise. And I want to make a point. Um, this is my reading and, and just a summary of what I've learned through the reading of Dallas Fuller's Great Commission. And, and in my years in Talbot, I came with a professor who studied under Dallas Willard. He said uh, these things, and if you and this, these notes are from Dallas Willard's Great Omission and J.I. Packer's Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. Jesus says this in the Great Omission, if we have lost this calling to, to, to go, and, and, and this has become somewhat of a choice, not a commandment not a must do in our Christian life. Many of us in our Christian life uh, think of evangelism as an option, as a you can do or, or not do, it's really your choice. But Jesus said this in Luke 10 too, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The harvest, there are many, many work to be done. There's so much work to be done but the laborers are few. Um, and I want to just go over what um, this book not only says, but this mandate, responsibility of the Great Commission was given to all Christians. It's not just for pastors. It's not just for missionaries. It's not just for um, a certain elect people who have studied the word of it's for everyone and not only is it for everyone it was central to the teaching of the church in the early church it was all about this one who when he came into faith when he came into the community of the church this was a teaching that was drilled into the believer and 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 some of the things that we see in the early church in Acts, um, this is very evident. This teaching is evident. Um, there was, this was a core fundamental um, part of teaching of, of the early church. In the book, um, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, this debate um, is in there and, and just go over this with me. Um, this divine, the question of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. How much are we supposed to leave up to God? We, we sometimes say this, we proclaim the gospel and uh, Dallas Willis says this in his book, our goal to evangelize, uh, J.F. Packer also says this too, that our evangelism, our responsibility to evangelism is just to preach the gospel and leave the rest up to the Lord. Um, I, so, I, I agree to jump, uh, jump back to a point that relieves the burden of, okay, we need to win this person over uh, ultimately to the Lord. 
but I can do my part and I can just leave. And I, I just want to make this point that it is somewhat a little bit irresponsible, not only just to preach, just to teach it, just to proclaim it, and then that's it. Leave it up to the Lord. Accept it, reject it, don't I, it's really up to you. This is the attitude that Jonah had when he went into Nineveh. Jonah had this attitude, I'm just going to say eight words. Repent, believe. Just, I don't care what happens to you. And he even showed that by the end of Jonah, by making a, a, a tabernacle almost, and, and seeing if God will judge the city or not. Just want, and just sitting back and realizing, okay, I, don't, I really would not care less what happens to this city, to these people. I'm just, I said what I said, I'm just going to leave it up to you, Lord. This attitude, and which is funny, it's, it's very interesting, this mystery of divine subhuman human responsibility. Our responsibility, yes, is to preach, is to teach, and, and, and proclaim the gospel. And it seems, I, I struggle with this, and yet God's heart, in, in Jonah as well, and, and also in the gospel, and, and throughout the Bible, God's heart is for the people. And God tells Jonah this, right? There are many, there are many who do not know their right hand from the left. Shouldn't I be concerned? And, and, and the question right there, God answers Jonah the question, it ends right there. Jonah ends right there. And Jesus in Luke 10 also says this too. The one who hears you, hears me. The one who rejects you, rejects me. Isn't that a scary verse? We have this responsibility to share. We have this responsibility to proclaim. And, and, and when we have done that, the one who hears us, hears the Lord. The one who rejects, rejects us, rejects the Lord. That is scary. That is the responsibility that we have. And this age-old debate between Calvinism and Arminianism, and this debate, um, I, I, I summarized uh, the, the Tulip theology. Um, this is um, the essence of Calvinism and Arminianism, divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Calvinism asserts um, total depravity of the human soul in in. in in, on the other hand, Arminianism talks about free will and human ability. Calvinism talks about limited atonement. And then Arminianism talks about universalism. Calvinism, unconditional election, and then conditional election. I, want to, I, I will mention this later on in our lecture. Um, we talks about irresistible grace the efficacious call of the Spirit, and Arminianism asserts that the Holy Spirit can effectually be resisted. Um, well, on the other hand, on, on the other Calvinism again, the last letter of P, to the P, perseverance of the saints versus the falling from grace. And I will mention, I will, I will explore this further in our lecture. And this is our third lecture, the challenge of Christian evangelism. Um, Willard, Willard here, Dallas Willard, um, I want to just quickly summarize what he says. He calls the Christian failure to make disciples the great omission. And here is what I have put in my second lecture, and I want to briefly mention in my third week, that Willard calls this failure to make disciples of every nation, this initial commandment, this great commission of God, right? The first was go and make disciples, right? Mathetes, um, the Greek word, make disciple. That's what it calls this Christian failure to make disciples a great omission. So, uh, I don't know if you have heard of the author A.W. Tozer. Willard severely criticizes that we have not, in our Christianity, we have not made uh, 
real, authentic, genuine disciples, we have made just church members, church goers. And we have labeled that as I have evangelized. I have um, brought this many people to church, not to Christ. And he calls this non-discipleship. And he invokes this, this term that A.W. Tozer mentioned in his book, that we have made so much vampire Christians. And, and this term, vampire Christian, I will explain further, but it is just wanting Christ just for His blood, using His blood. This blood-sucking culture that we have entered, we have, um, we have invited into our church, we haven't made disciples, we have made vampire Christians. Um, the challenge here, a challenge to Christian evangelism, again, another part is prosperity gospel. It's a huge problem in the church right now. In fact, it is not a gospel at all. And we have in many charismatic circles a canonic gospel that Christ has somehow emptied himself in kenosis, become like us. That is heresy. Christ is different. Christ is God. That, that messes with the divinity of Christ. These sound like heresies of old, but they have re-emerged and resurfaced in our present culture today. Prosperity gospel, canonic gospel. So Willard, in his book, Great Omission, he calls for a holistic paradigm shift to not reduce the gospel just to justification. But it has to do with sanctification. There's so many parts of our salvation, not just justification. So he mentions these things as a holistic paradigm shift, and we want to cover that. We just want to skip that um, for now. We want to cover that later on. So here we go. We go into part three. What is evangelism? And here, I just want to take a break on what we want to talk about. And so far, it's going to be pretty hard um, mentioning all of this. But I just want to give you a, a brief summary of what we'll talk about. And then we will go into more practicals on how to evangelize, how to, um, yes, how, the methodology of these things. Um, we come to this part of part three, what is evangelism? Again, I just want to focus on my thesis, my main point. My main point of all these lectures is to really make a case saying evangelism is not this terminology that we hear about. It's not just going into subway or going into a, a place of gathering and getting a bullhorn and, and, and preaching about Jesus and talking. You can't do that. That is, that is a way. But I want to talk about a, a holistic paradigm shift, just as Dallas, Dallas Wood is talking about. I want to talk about a holistic approach to evangelism. And in order to do that, we need to have correct view. So, um, because I, I have all these things um, lined up for us in a lecture, it is because I believe um, evangelism is not only just a, a, a thing we do, uh, not only just um, something that is omitted that we need to win back, not only just a, um, do you remember what I talked about? A A I M approaching, inviting, maintaining in a winsome way, so I can um, have that relationship. It's not just um, communicating with someone. It's actually a spiritual discipline. It's in fact the loftiest, the highest form of spiritual discipline. This is my thesis. This is my point. That is why I have why the why of evangelism, the what, and how. Why, the what, and how. And in order to understand the why, we have covered all these things that I just talked about. Now is what. What. What is evangelism? What, what do I want to 
talk about? What do I want to say to you today? And if you just follow along in our, in our lecture notes, what is evangelism? What is evangelism? And let's go to our book back here. If you have this book with me, it's, it's going to really be help, of help to you as we follow along because I have um, read uh, and most of our teachings um, and, and our lecture notes have come from uh, Albert Lee's Introduction to Evangelism. Um, and these outlines I, I, I have mentioned in a way so that you have a clear basis of what to think, what we can really recognize that it is, um, what, what is evangelism. First, I want to talk about biblical basis. Second is convictional basis. Third is spiritual basis. And I want to just add, I have added ministerial mystical, but that will come later on. First, I want to talk about the biblical basis. This, I, I have already mentioned the evangelistic mandate. This mandate to evangelize is not only central in the teaching, but it's central to the mission of church in any age. Um, because... I believe that this goes, this is the one single theme that flows throughout the Bible, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New. And you can see, um, the notes have been a little bit misled here, but um, in the Old Testament, we can see through the um, Adam, the, throughout the covenants, the Adamic view, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, the Noahic view, from the perspective of Noah, Genesis 9, the Abrahamic view, Genesis 12, the Mosaic view, Deuteronomy 11, and so forth, and the Davidic view, mostly it flows throughout the covenants of the Old Testament. And in, in each of these covenants, I want to make a point, I want to make a case that each of these covenants are evangelistic in their approach, in their essence. And throughout the, not just the Old Testament, but also in the Apostles, the view of the Apostles, and the history of church, the patristic, the church, early church fathers, and then through the Reformers, and through the evangelical view, and the modern perspective of evangelism. I will cover that later on in our fourth lecture of this quarter. Um, I want to highlight here that the challenge of contemporary evangelism is that there is a desperate need for a holistic integration of biblical and theological knowledge. Here, I talked about the holistic approach. We need a biblical theological knowledge on one hand and experience. And my experience as a, for example, my life, uh, I have these expe rich experiences of sharing the gospel in many different cultures. In Asia, in America, um, in, in, in the Pacific, I have all these experiences and also all these biblical theological, theological knowledge, they can't be separate, they can't be a schism. They need to be holistically integrated in order to have an effective witness. I want to I wanna say this, this divide um, is the contemporary challenge that we have. Um, we are, I want to also mention that scholasticism is the separation of biblical rationale and spiritual faith. Again, I want to mention this again. Scholasticism is the separation of biblical rationale, biblical theological knowledge, and spirituality, this experience, this know-how, this um, approach, the, this practical approach to evangelism. So, um, I want to talk briefly, mention after that, because in order to talk about scholasticism, we need to talk about the Enlightenment. And in, in, the, in the Enlightenment, the separation of faith and reason occurred. And I'm in Enlightenment, I'm talking about the philosophical movement that happened. Um, <clears throat> with this challenge, 
a different kind, different holistic kind of integration is necessary for theological um, basis. Our, 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 our basis, again, here is biblical foundation, right? You know, to have a biblical foundation in evangelism. This Trinitarian, Trinitarian theology, for example, must be a source, must be an essence, must be the primary source of evangelism. Um, secondly, I want to move on toward convictional basis. Um, not only the biblical basis first, first and foremost, and then convictional basis right here. Um, this biblical standard I mentioned here um, in the previous section, and the evangelism in the early church. Jesus, uh, the singular Jesus in a pluralistic culture, what this means is that Jesus, um, not only Judaism, and, and there were many monotheistic, um, there were many monotheistic religions at that time. Jesus, um, when, when he came, it was interesting in that he brought a complicated monotheism. Judaism, um, Judaism is, is a religion that uh, focuses on one God, Yahweh. Islam also Allah, one, one God, but Jesus brought complex monotheism. Even though uh, we have a Trinitarian theology, Christianity is known as a complex monotheism. I will cover that more briefly in our essence uh, section of our lecture. I want to briefly cover Christian history of evangelism throughout the ages that I have mentioned again through patristic, through the church, the early church, patristic, church fathers, and Reformation, etc. And want to talk about the theology of evangelism, the continuation of Trinitarian theology, missional theology, incarnational Christology. Um, and here, just want to mention again, the separation of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Here, orthodoxy meaning the right way of doing things, the correct theological way of doing things. Orthopraxy meaning um, uh, orthodoxy meaning the right, um, the learning, the right theology, the correct theology of things. Orthopraxy without orthodoxy leads to emotionalism, sensationalism, subjectivism, mysticism, esotericism. I want to cover all of those things again in our lecture. Orthodoxy without orthopraxy leads to scholasticism, rationalism, formalism, and legalism. Again, I want to focus again. If you just have, in put in simpler terms, if you just have practical knowledge, the know-how, if you just have the practical methodology in evangelism, it just leads to emotionalism, sensationalism, subjectivism, mysticism, and esotericism. It just leads to baseless claims. It just leads to emotional comings and goings. But if you just have knowledge, head knowledge, if you just have seminary knowledge, if you just have university information without any practical know how, without any practical application, it leads to just scholasticism, learning, information, data. It just leads to rationalism, formalism, and legalism. And my my point, my a uh, point in this section, this convictional basis, our conviction must not just be ortho orthodox orthodoxy, focus on orthodoxy, but it needs to, not only does it need to lean towards just orthopraxy, but it needs to be integrated. This, I want this radical integration of knowledge and practice, and I want to hopefully provide you with this convictional basis here. Thirdly, I want to cover the spiritual basis, spiritual basis. I want to hear, uh, just, I don't know if you have followed along with me. I talked about in our first section, the sexual definition, I talked about the essence of God, essence of Christ, essence of humanity, the simple terms, who God is, who Christ is, who am I. And here in our spiritual uh, basis, I have who? The Spirit is, Holy Spirit. Pneumatology, and then a little bit about who the Holy Spirit is, and then 
anthropology of who we are, and in that, a testimony of different Christian witnesses. And I want to talk about touch ecclesiology as well. Fourthly, I have added this and basically, basically mentioned um, the ministerial mystical basis. This basically means that evangelism, if evangelism is a spiritual discipline, again, I have mentioned that evangelism is a spiritual discipline as my main point, as my main thesis. So if this is true, if my case has proven true, if I argue correctly, if evangelism is a spiritual discipline, then the ministry, the fruits, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit must be embodied in the witness. Okay, let me say that again. If evangelism is a spiritual discipline, then the ministry, the fruits, gifts of the Holy Spirit must be embodied in the witness, must come naturally. First, we focus on evangelism as a spiritual discipline, the highest form of it. Then the ministry, the fruits, the gifts of the Holy Spirit accompanies the witness. It must be evident in our witness. And I, folk, I, I just want to prove that with the ministerial mystical basis of evangelism. And lastly, we come to the third part of our, uh, of our journey of what evangelism is. First, we talked about why and the what, and I covered all these things. We come to the how, how to evangelize. Here comes the practical method, practical application of evangelism. The methodological base of evangelism, part one, part two. Here we talk about uh, the method, the practices. Now we get down to business here, commissional foundation. And we're going to see the vocation of ministry and mission. We're going to also see the evangelism in the early church um, throughout history. Um, and also the history of evangelism, embodying the theology, all these things, we're going to see that. Um, in our second part, how to mobilize, how to reach the unreached, evangelism, the next generation, mass evangelism, the glory of God over methodology. And I just want to focus on why we do this um, and how, what and how. This three focus has um, severe, uh, as, as um, great implications, profound implications on, on what evangelism is. And as we talk about this evangelism in this lecture, I just want to mention that we do all these things for the glory of God. Without the glory of God, um, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't amount to anything. And our main focus um, over methodology needs to be for the, for the pursuit of the glory of God, to bring glory to Him. Um, that is basically summary, the basic summary of what we will be talking about in this class. Um, again, it's going to be hard. It's going to be um, difficult. There's going to be a lot of definitions, and yet this will hopefully equip you and really um, challenge you to evangelize. So um, with our time that we have, I just want to briefly dive into our first section, why we evangelize, just to just for a brief definition um, before we begin. Um, before we begin, <clears throat> um, has there been any times when you have been witness to? And that sometimes it's it's different witnessing to someone, and it is sometimes interesting to to be witnessed by someone um, I recently had an opportunity to talk to someone who actually started sharing about God's Word and I didn't reveal myself at first that I am also a Christian that I'm also a believer and yet he started um, searching for some conversational topic so he started saying hey what do you do 
um, and he started talking about his wife and he started talking about his marriage and, and he somehow started to talk about God. And this is a conversational skill as well. He started talking about how, how the day was, how the weather was, how he has uh, met his wife, how he has a, a wonderful marriage and here begins his testimony. And he says, uh, I'm just going to say his, his name is Bill. Bill says this, Bill said, um, you know why, this is what he said, this is a true story, you know why we have this amazing marriage, right? And, he, and, I, was, I, I, and I asked him, I said, how long were you married? How, um, how long have you been married? And he said, this is my 20th year, 20, 20th year of being married, married to my wife. And when he said that, he said, he asked this question, do you know, you know why? You know why we've been married for, for that long, right? Do you know the reason? And he said, because of God. God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And through this God conversation, be, even before I had the chance to say, hey, hey Bill, by the way, I, I'm also a believer. I, I know your brother. I wrong wrong on keep doing what you're doing i love what you're doing thank you for sharing the gospel but just go keep doing that keep doing what you're doing Be, even before i could encourage that he was already ready to share his testimony the gospel he was ready he was ready and willing to share all his life before a stranger he said i was I was the son of a pastor. I did not want to hear God's word. I even went to a point because my father, who was a pastor, kept on preaching to me. He said, you need to believe in God. You need to believe in Christ. You need to know Jesus. Because I kept on hearing that. He, this is his, this is Bill test, Bill's testimony. He said, I want to, I wanted to kill my father. I wanted to put my father to death. I wanted to kill my father so that. I, I, I had that feeling for so long, so that when I turned 18, I left the house. He left the house. He left home, came to California, and he partied, he had drugs, he had many girlfriends, he had so he lived a life like a prodigal son, like a story of a prodigal son. And, and, and what got to him at, po at one point is that, okay, if I keep doing these drugs, I won't be able to survive. And if I do die, if I OD and die, what if, what well, all those things, all those times when, when my father talked about Christ and how he had died for me and how there is an eternal heaven and hell, what if there is a hell? That was his aha moment. That was his point when he said, Oh my God, if I continue to do this, I will die. If I OD today, if I take too much drugs, if I am killed by some some gangster today, if I'm mugged today, and if I die, if I go to hell, if I die today, will I go to hell? Is hell real? And he said this prayer, and he didn't even know that God listened to him anymore because he was so far from faith. And listen, just, just remembering what his father had preached to him before, he, he said this prayer. The true story, this is what I, even, I didn't even have the chance to say. Brother, I'm a believer. I love this. I just want to keep on listening because he was so good at just naturally just sharing his story. He said, I said this prayer right then and there. I said, God, reveal yourself to me if you're real. I'm going to take one month and in this one month, reveal yourself to me if you're real. Show me a miracle. Show me something that I can place my faith on you. Show me a miracle. And, and, and this prayer was answered in a miraculous way. He started. He remember back back before he left home, he wanted to kill his father. He started in his deep in his heart. And after he said this prayer, he started having um, the heart. To love his father again. From some he he says he doesn't know where he got this from, but he started having affection, love for his father. 
So he went back to his father and said, Dad, father, dad, I, you know what? When I was with you, I wanted to kill you. I didn't, I, I hated hearing the gospel. I wanted to kill you, but I'm so sorry. When he said that, his father embraced him and said, son, I've always loved you. And with that embrace, he realized that this was, this reconciliation could not have happened. Could not have happened. Not only that reconciliation was a sign, a miraculous sign, but his, his drug habit, his girlfriends, his relationships, all, all these things, smoking habit, drugs, not only did they disappear pretty much throughout that month, he started realizing once he had accepted, saying that, okay, I want to really show who, who you are, God. I want to receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. When he said those things, said those prayers, he was able to see his life drastically change. And he said, he, well, it's really funny, he said, Everything stopped, my drugs, everything stopped, but smoking, that stopped eventually, gradually. So there are some gradual changes too. But for him, he said, these things happen. That's why I know God's real. I have placed my faith in him. And I have never looked back. These 20 years, I met my girlfriend, I met my wife now. And I have lived, I have been faithful to her. And I have lived these 20 years and I've never looked back. And he was here was the presentation. Son, do you believe? Do you believe in God? And if you don't, I want to meet him today. I want you to meet him today. And it is then when I said, Brother, I am actually a believer too. Thank you for the story. Love it. We were able to say this and, and, and another thing that he said really struck a chord. This is really important. He said, Brother, when we do share our gospel, when we share our stories, when we share our testimony, it becomes spiritual food. It feeds our spirit. And here is what I want to mention because my main point of my lectures are that evangelism is a spiritual discipline. It's a spiritual discipline with a spiritual promise. I hope this story not only just ends like a story, not just, um, I hope this anecdote gives you some heart toward, huh, it's not just the pastors, it's not just the missionaries, it's not just the church organizing something to, to do missions, to do evangelism, to do a ministry. It is your own life. It is your personal life that needs to become a witness. Witness. So, here is this story. Um, and it really, it really, it, it was really, and, and after that he said, um, let's, you know, let's keep praying for one another. And, and we said goodbye. Um, but yeah, this is what I want to drill in to our course. Um, again, I want to briefly, with the time that we have, I want to mention the essential definitions of evangelism. What is evangelism? What is the, this word, evangelism? Word is very important. Um, and I have this verse here, go and therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe that all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Great commission. Christ's last statement on earth. Here, I just want to talk about some definitions. <clears throat> Evangelism in Hebrew is besorah, the closest word, gospel, besorah. Um, good news in Greek is euangelion, you meaning good, angelo meaning message, bring a good message. Angelos is a messenger. <clears throat> in Latin is evangelium, French is evangelistic, English is evangelism. 
Um, here I talk about the historical perspective. Um, <clears throat> in our study, we just want to mention briefly um, of all these different historical biblical perspectives. In Adam, in creation, the fundamental focus of God is Adam was sent again. Just God, just as God is a sending God, Adam was also sent into the world as he was created, as it became Nefesh Kaya. Adam was sent into, into the world with a message. And God blessed him. God blessed man and the woman, right? Be fruitful and multiply. That was the message. That was the, um, again, we, if we have the Great Commission in the New Testament, that was the commission given to man to work the land, to be fruitful and multiply. This is evident in Genesis 1, 26, 30, Genesis 2, 16, 17. This was the Adamic view, Adamic covenant. Right, and but we see that this uh, covenant, Adamic promise, um, the human human beings sin in Genesis three, and this covenant, this promise, um, becomes um, somehow warped uh, because of the fall. God continues this this pattern of promising. Of bringing this covenant, promising Adam, promising Noah, promising Abraham, promising Moses, promising David. So, if we follow these covenants, we can see the historical perspective perspective of the Bible. Um, Here, um, throughout these history, throughout the biblical history, um, in these uh, biblical figures, we see an establishment of God's how God works. So in Adam, he had um, the man and the woman, right, becoming uh, the first man and the woman. They were in in Genesis one and two. They were the covenant bearers for the world to be fruitful and multiply they they had to fill the earth um, instead what they did with sin with Genesis 3 they um, it ended up being a curse for them they were cursed they were banished from the garden with Noah God saw that the world world was filled with, and, and he said he regretted even creating man. And with Noah, this promise of a rainbow, right? To never rid the world again through, through the flood, right? That was the promise, right? And through Abraham, um, that I'll make a, uh, that whoever blesses you will, will be a blessing. Whoever curses you will be cursed. And he gives a blessing, Abrahamic covenant, right? Blessing that I'll make a great nation. I'll make you prosperous. I'll make you uh, all these pr promises that he gives are, are covenants that he makes with um, Abraham. And in Adam, it's evangelistic, right? Go and, and, and be fruitful. In Noah, again, I'll, I will not destroy you with the flood any longer. Go, be fruitful again. With Abraham, I'll make you a great nation, right? I'll make you a great nation through Isaac. And so go. Go. And in Abraham, it's a little bit different. His covenant was multifaceted. But Abraham had to not only um, trust in God's promises, but he had to go. He had to leave his land of the Father. Uh, the, he, his father's land and he had to go into the promised land and in the Abrahamic uh, covenant there is more than just Abraham there, there's his Abraham uh, there's Isaac 
is Jacob. It's all included in the covenant. And God always says, go, go, leave your, leave, leave your, the land of your father and go, go to the land I have shown. I'll give this as your possession. I'll make your, I'll make your descendants numerous as the stars. Right? He takes Abraham at night and see the stars. Look at the stars in the sky. Can you number them? Your, your descendants will be prosper, you, so numerous that you cannot count. And Ab, Ab, God promised Abraham that it will be through Sarah, through Isaac, that you will see this promise. Through Isaac, right? Through Jacob, this covenant continues. Through Moses, right? This, through Moses, Moses had to go proclaim um, God's message not only to Egypt, saying, "Let my people go." So they can be, they can come out of Egypt to serve. This is very mission evangelistic in, in, in its essence. David as well. David had to, David in his first, David's a little bit different. It's a, not only a missional evangelistic covenant, but it's also a uh, messianic covenant as well. So David's view is very special as well. Um, with the apostles, of course. Go and, and, and make disciples of every nation, Matetes, baptizing them, ba baptism, um, and teaching them, Didasco, teaching them. All these three steps were in the apostolic view, apostolic teaching. And not only Paul, and we can see in Acts, mainly um, Peter taught the first half, and then the second half of Acts, and throughout the New Testament, the primary approach of Paul is to teach. It's a, didas a didactic method. Um, as you saw in our, in our first scripture reading today with John 3, Jesus answers, Nicodemus asks. This question, answer, back and forth, this teaching dialogue that happened, this was, main, this was the main um, approach that Paul had, this teaching method. Teaching them, right? Discipling, teaching them uh, what ha everything that I have taught you. That was the Great Commission. But just, the early church fathers were adopted this view too because this was a central teaching of the early church. The reformers, reformers. Reformers were also uh, Martin Luther, um, Calvin, Zwingli. They were all in, in its history. Um, evangelistic as well, and other modern perspective as well. Um, I don't want to get into the philosophical perspective, uh, for this is pretty, um, yeah, it, once we get into it, we need to get into it. But I just want to cover what we want to talk about this perspective. Um, first, one of the church fathers, Augustinian, uh, Augustinian view, I have briefly summarized their philosophical views. Augustine believes, um, beliefs were very influential in the church. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, Car Cartesian or Descartes, um, Dodwell, John Locke, Barthian, Panberg, Platinga, all these views um, are actually, if, if you see the, the recommended reading in Reasonable Faith, um, I will mention this in our next session um, again. Also, um, because of these philosophical perspectives, um, I want to focus on this holistic evangelism. Uh, I want to cover experiential evangelism, relational evangelism, um, also scientific evangelism, interdisciplinary evangelism, cross-cultural. These are some uh, parts of this perspective and this method um, and and then it takes to it takes us to essence of God and I will focus on this on our next um, part but this is basically what we will be talking about in our lectures um, it'll be a little bit philosophy and heavy but um, again it'll be 
it'll be meaningful, it'll be effectual in your in your uh, evangelism. And just like I shared about the story of Bill and other many, I'm going to share many instances of sometimes getting evangelized too, and also evangelizing. Um, again, you see that question back and forth. That still um, is very useful today. Um, asking the right questions sometimes is, is more important than, than saying the right things. Uh, in a way, as, as, as I mentioned an example with Bill, even just having a great conversation with starter is, is a method in and in it of itself. Um, he started off by, right, Bill started off by saying, you know why? Because there is a God, right? He already mentions that there is a God. It's not an atheistic, it's atheistic view. He already starts off by a theistic worldview. Not only does he lay a ground for what he's going to talk about, but he introduces a theistic worldview. So you can sometimes you can do this naturally, but knowing this and integrating holistic integration, right? Where we're talking about a spiritual discipline, holistic integration of evangelism, we need to know all these things in order to say, okay, this is right. What I'm saying is correct, and I want to in implement that in our daily practices so that whenever we share our story just sharing our story simple as that is that can be evangelistic that can be fulfilling the great commission and again i've talked about this book saying um in um, j.i packer's evangelism evangelism and sovereignty of god j.i packer mentions that just just like um just like jonah the same couple of words god died for you, he loves you, he died for you, he sent his only son for you, so that God, no, so that Christ would die for you, so that you can eternal life. Just quoting John 3, 16, that J.I. Packer almost says that that is your responsibility as a believer, that's it. I, I want to reiterate that, that can be, that yes, in, in, in definition, yes, that that is what we are supposed to do. That is our the responsibility of the believer. That is our responsibility as a Christian. We do need to witness. And that takes sometimes takes the burden off of our um, hearts, off of us, right? We can just share it. We can just proclaim it, herald it, and be done, and be okay. But I want to bring a counter argument or I want to argue that that is sometimes a little bit I think irresponsible in a way just like Bill who could have just said oh son do you have a faith do you have faith in Christ do you have a religion do you have faith I believe in Christ so you, you should believe because Christ died for you and you can get eternal life you can obtain eternal life if you believe in him he could have just said that he could have omitted every story that he had told me in his witness, in his evangelism, but he didn't do it. He actually sh he went, through the, went through the hard uh, work of sharing his story, sharing his faith, being comfortable enough with a stranger to share detailed parts of his story. He was able to do that because this, he, this wasn't the first time he's done this. He has done this with many years of practice. Probably ever since he has been saved, he has been sharing it. And it becomes food for his soul. It becomes nutrition for his soul. And he is the prime example I want to mention with our lecture today. Evangelism, sovereignty of God. Sometimes we need to go above and beyond. Have that attitude. And I, want, I want to end our lecture with this today. I love uh, one of the books. I don't know if you know this book called Pilgrim's Progress. It came out into animation, videos, and movies as well. But in Pilgrim's Progress, there comes an evangelist. There comes an evangelist. A person named evangelist. And 
the main protagonist of Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Christian, he has this big, big bag, baggage on, on his shoulders and he's carrying it. And he is reading parts of, he's reading this book, the Bible, and he wants a way, he wants to find the way to eternal life. And this evangelist comes, what he does, and he points, points to this way.